All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining. I am going to get started in about another minute or so. Okay, welcome everybody to the Supporting Student Financial Wellness uh, segment of our summit. Um, I thank you so very much for taking this time, particularly after lunch, to talk a bit about how we can support our students. Um, a bit about myself, I am um, one of the directors in the financial aid office. I've been at AU for almost 18 years now, I can't believe it. And fun fact, my daughter, uh, will be an incoming freshman this fall. So um, without further ado, I want to make sure that we spend our time this afternoon really diving into like what's there to help our students, what's there to help you um, as we assist our families and our students in navigating um, the, the financing portion of their education um, and also giving some foundational um, fundamental information around how we give tools and information around financial wellness, um, not only to help serve them while they're here, but also throughout their life. So I want to make sure that we talk a bit about some of the resources that we offer our students. Um, the other segment of our conversation today um, will be around some of the things that we inadvertently do um, that cause financial stress or may harm students um, in ensuring that they have the finances that they need in order to progress and to complete their education at AU. And then lastly, I'm going to leave time for any questions that you might have. Um, because again, I really want this session to be interactive. Um, and I am going to ask you to unmute yourself and shout out answers um, as I um, pose questions. Um, and, you know, to ask me to pause if something's unclear so that, you know, I can ensure that the information that I'm providing you can use and will be of assistance to you. So without further ado, I'm going to go to our very first question. Bear with me for one second. I need to make sure that we get to our presentation. So here's a quick quiz. True or false? Only aid recipients have a designated financial aid counselor. Anybody? False, absolutely right. Um, every student has an assigned financial aid counselor, everyone. So whether or not you're receiving any money from you or not, you have someone you can speak to. So should something change in your family circumstances and you find that you need assistance, please send them our way. Um, every student has um, a counselor, um, and we set the assignments based on this, the first initial of the student's last name. Um, and we help our students with a myriad of financial questions. You know, if they have an AU scholarship, we talk to them about how to retain it, how to renew those, uh, the scholarship. If they have need-based assistance from us, we talk about the process, ensuring that they complete the application and help them navigate through that process. Um, federal work study, um, and if you don't know what that is, I promise I'll go into it a little bit, um, but we help students understand whether or not they're eligible um, and to provide information around like how they can use it and how the funds will apply if they decide to use it. For instance, work study is just like having a part-time job. Students get paid for the hours that they work in a check, um, and so doesn't directly apply to the bill. So those are some of the questions that we assist our students and families in navigating. And then lastly, we do help families understand what federal loans are available 
Um, and then, you know, we do give information around the, the private loans that are out there as well. So those are just broad topics that we assist our students and families in navigating. So here's our next question. It's a multiple choice one, right? How in the world are students supposed to reach their financial aid counselor or financial aid counselor in our office? Do they email them at financialaid.american.edu or call their direct extension? Do they book an appointment through um, a, a, a platform? We do use You Can Book Me. Do they walk into our building, which is Asbury 200? Is it A and D or is it all of the above? Anyone? All of the above. Thank you. <laughs> you are absolutely right. We actually have counselors available every single day. We have walk-in um, for our students so they can call us directly, they can email us, they can do a video conference. And so we try to make sure that we are accessible and available to our students, whether they're on campus, off campus, or if they wanna do a video conference with their parents. Um, we, we have those options available. Um, and so without further ado, I do want to go through how do you get there? Um, the way that students can come to us is by going to American.edu financial aid. On the left navigation menu, there is the contact us. From there, they can scroll down, select either the population that they're a part of or their last name. Their counselor's name and number will come up. They can either email them or book an appointment. And in this case, you know, Elise says, how would you like to meet with me, either phone or Zoom? From there, her calendar and ability pops up. You select a time. We ask a few questions in order to identify who you are and the reason for the meeting. You click confirm book booking and you're set and good to go. And so that's how our students can meet with us and can set their, um, their virtual appointments. All right, next question. Fill in the blank for student billing, payment plans, 529 account questions. Where should they go? Where should our students go? I get this question a lot. Anybody? Is it AU Central? I'm guessing. Yes, Christina, okay. you got this. <laughs> AU Central <laughs> is where students can go for billing questions and for registration and for student health questions. Um, and so oftentimes um, there's confusion around like, what does the financial aid office uh, do? And then again, what are the, the areas that AU Central can assist a student? And so that's the distinction between our two offices. All right, we've got another true or false question, everyone. Do we provide information around financial fundamentals, such as budgeting, banking, credit? It's an easy one. Anybody? True. <laughs> we do. So our website actually has short videos on all of it from how to create a budget, <laughs> writing a check, signing up for direct deposit. Um, and so I just wanted to show you really quickly how to get there. So again, it's on the American.edu slash financial aid site. On the left navigation, you go to financial literacy. And then from there, you'll see how to create a budget, credit basics, working um, direct deposit, checks, et cetera. So each video is around 10, um, nine to 10 minutes, um, 12 minutes long. There's one on credit basics that goes through all of the information that students need to know. And that one's slightly longer at about 20 minutes, but um, it does take students through some of the fundamental information that they need to understand not only while they're in school, but also when they get out of school and have to navigate you know, their very first paycheck and how to open a bank account. So all of that information is on our website. I am actually going to put in a shameless plug around um, some of the courses that we do offer that most people are not aware of. Um, COGOD has Finance 200, which is a three credit course that's open to everyone and that you can take that will help students figure out all of the pieces. So um, understanding the basic lingo around financial literacy, understanding savings and investment. 
But a lot of students are like, I don't have room in my course work or my course schedule for a three credit course. And what I love that Kogod has done is that they offer every single semester um, a one credit course that breaks up the information that is provided in Finance 200. And this is online. And so students um, have a lot more flexibility in being able to enroll in this particular course and learn the information. So the very first one credit course is Finance 197. And it again provides just the basic um, information around personal finance, personal finance literacy. The next course is Finance um, 198, right? And so this particular course um, covers information around debt, insurance and savings. And then lastly, I wish I had this information when I was 18, 19, 20. Um, there's information, very um, clear, direct information on investing. Um, explains how investments work, the different types. Uh, and so again, shameless plug, but this allows students, you know, if they have a need for a one credit course, I highly recommend that every student um, takes advantage of um, of, you know, these courses that are offered through CoGuard. All right, I'm going to switch gears uh, a bit and talk a little bit about some of the definitions that matter to a student, uh, particularly in retaining their aid. So the very first question that I have is what's the minimum number of credits that a student needs to be enrolled in in order to be considered full-time um, as an undergraduate? And as that, folks in the chat are saying, it's C. <laughs> thank you. I can't see the chat. So thank you for- Ah, for you're welcome. No, people have been answering your questions in the chat all along. Oh my goodness. And all of so the academic advisors. <laughs> <laughs> are saying that it's C for this Thank one. Thank you. That's absolutely right. And so, Justina, if I ask a question and you see that I don't recognize, just feel free to unmute and, and um, let me know. So thank you very much for, for that. And you're absolutely right. It is C. Now, why is this important? This is really important because it's a federally mandated minimum that full-time be defined as 12 credits. Okay, and because of that, um, AU's funding, meaning if you're getting an AU Merit Scholarship, a Presidential, a Dean's, a Frederick Douglass, um, all of that is tied to a student being enrolled and continuously enrolled in 12 credits. Um, the AU grant funding is also tied to full-time enrollment. So they have to stay enrolled throughout the, I'm so sorry? Okay, I thought I heard someone um, pipe in, but students have to remain continuously enrolled, meaning up until the very last day of class, they have to be in 12 credits, because if they're not, then their financial aid from AU is in jeopardy. Um, they stand to lose the entire amount of um, that award for that semester. So keep that in mind when students are coming to you saying, hey, I need to drop this class. Um, please send them to their financial aid counselor. Let them have a conversation with us before they drop their enrollment below 12. Now, if a student is going from 15 to 12, doesn't make a difference. They're still a full-time student. And so it won't necessarily impact um, their eligibility for aid. Um, it may, because we're going to get to this in a moment, um, especially if in their, they're in the habit of dropping credits but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so next question, fill in the blank. What is the federally mandated audit that AU has to, and every school has to conduct um, in order to uh, determine um, whether or not a student is eligible for aid renewal? SAP. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Tyler, you gotta tell me, what does SAP stand for? Satisfactory academic progress. There you go. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So that's exactly what this is. 
Um, I know we throw around SAP all the time. I just wanted people to understand that this is not something that AU is making up. It's not anything that we are trying to uh, hinder our students or, or create roadblocks or barriers. We must conduct this audit. Um, it's required of us before we can award a student for the next um, academic year. And so for our students who are getting a scholarship from us, from an AU um, issued scholarship, they must um, retain and maintain a, um, a 3.0 cumulative GPA. 2.9 will not cut it. They will lose eligibility for this scholarship if they are below a 3.0 GPA. Um, they also must successfully complete two thirds of all attempted credits. So I was talking a bit about, you know, students who say drop um, courses and are habitually dropping attempted credits, even if they don't go below 12 credit hours, um, they stand to lose their award if they're dropping um, a number of courses that, that unfortunately their credit completion falls below 66.67% or two thirds of all attempted credits. Um, so keep that in mind as students are coming um, to you and talking about, hey, I'm concerned, uh, I'm not doing well in this class, I'm thinking of dropping it. If they're in the habit of doing that, that may eventually catch up with them. Um, students are eligible for merit um, funding. So their presidential, their deans, um, uh, from AU for up to eight semesters. Now, semesters, not terms. So for students who want to use money during the summer terms, they can't use their AU merit money during the summer terms. That's only available for students who are in the three-year um, scholar programs, the, the three-year intensive programs. They can use their money year-round because it is um, part of their course of study. Summer is an, considered an elective term, and therefore merit funding is not available during that semester or the, I'm sorry, that term. Need-based aid. Now that's AU grant, that's federal grant, Pell grant, the direct loans, federal work study. Um, the standards for students to retain eligibility and to get their funding renewed um, is a 2.0 cumulative GPA. And they also need to complete, you know, two thirds of all of their attempted credits. AU grant, however, can be awarded in the summer for up to 10 semesters, right? Um, because we do award a summer, specifically a summer AU grant award um, to assist students. So in total, they can have up to 10 semesters of grant funding. All right, true or false. All grades for an academic year must be recorded by the registrar, this is important, before the financial aid office can conduct our SAP audit. Is that true or false? Anybody? True. Thank you, Sunhi. You're absolutely right. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people don't realize this. Say a student, you know, completed 15 credits, grades for, you know, four of the five classes are in. We still can't assess whether or not a student is eligible for aid until all, and please forgive me, of course, my cat loves to come and join the conversation, until all of the grades have been reported. Now, this can have a, um, a negative impact on our students and families. It's like a domino effect. The grade isn't reported. We can't run satisfactory academic progress audit. We can't then determine what the student's eligible to receive for the next year. The student gets a bill, it shows that they owe the full amount, the family then is panicked because they're thinking something's wrong, they're contacting everyone, the financial aid office, their academic um, unit, the dean's students, the president's office, where's my funding, you promised that I would be eligible, I've done everything I needed to do, and it's all because a grade hadn't been reported. And so we tell our students and families, 
yes, you can anticipate that we're going to run this audit at the end of May. So we try to give two to three weeks for all grades to be reported before we run the satisfactory academic audit, before the vast majority of students were able to do so. But every year, we have a good chunk of students in which we can't, unfortunately, um, conduct that evaluation um, and who end up feeling significant financial stress around the fact that we are not able to communicate their eligibility for aid. I'm gonna stop there and see if anyone has a question because I do get this question quite often. Um, I have one question uh, regarding summer AU grant. That yes. means when students uh, who are receiving financial aid would like to enroll in summer courses, then they can get financial aid for the summer uh, period as well. That is that correct? So AU over the last couple of years has piloted awarding funding to students who apply for summer aid and have eligibility. Um, it's not guaranteed. And given our current financial um, environment, we don't know whether or not we will be providing summer funding for summer 2024. But if it is available, we do communicate to the entire student population um, that need-based aid is available during the summer to include the AU summer grant. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. No, thank you. Anybody else? All right, we're gonna keep on trucking. Here's the next question. Incomplete grades are factored as attempted but not completed credits, impact a student's GPA, may jeopardize a student's age eligibility, A and C, or all of the above? All right, guys, I'm gonna try to see if I can see this. Everyone is saying D, 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 D. This was a trick question and you're absolutely right. Incomplete grades are attempted but not completed because the assessment is based within the time frame allotted for that particular course. So if they're asking for additional time, then unfortunately they didn't complete, um, they didn't successfully complete the course um, in the time allotted. Um, and giving a student an incomplete, um, and we see this often, will um, jeopardize their aid for the upcoming term because oftentimes it counts towards the total number of attempted credits but not completed, which will drop a student below the two thirds level. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. And so often I see it far less now, but we used to see grades of incomplete that are given to a student who already the default grade would have been an A or a B. And I am thinking of a number of cases where the student who has done well in that course because they took an incomplete wasn't eligible for aid in the subsequent year because we had to count that incomplete as a failure to complete um, sufficient credits. Um, and therefore they had to appeal um, and there is a process to appeal a, uh, a SAP failure. Um, we have a checklist, which I'm happy um, to share with everyone. It actually is on our website um, underneath the Satisfactory Academic Progress um, tab on the left navigation. So if ever students have questions about what's needed or how to navigate that process, it is available on our, um, on our, on our site, on our home page, um, under Satisfactory Academic Progress on the left navigation tab. Guess what? We made it. <laughs> and I believe we have about 10 minutes to spare. Um, I wanted to make sure that I left enough time um, to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and 
um, to, and it doesn't need to be restricted to the information that we covered in this presentation. Um, I just wanted to give an overview of our students do have us all here um, to support them um, and that um, everyone has an assigned financial aid counselor um, and that anytime a student is thinking about a change in enrollment, they really do need to speak to our office to ensure that we can assist them in retaining the aid that they've received. And with that, I'm going to ask if there are any questions. I have a question. Do you guys have any um, regular, like one page, frequently asked questions kind of situation that um, undergrads or graduate students have access to? So we do send out every single actually semester, uh, a just in time that speaks to hi, you've received this aid. Please make sure that you do the following to keep it. Also, here's a timeline of what you can anticipate will happen in the next semester. Make sure you do this. Make sure you speak to your advisors about that. So we do send a message with all of the salient pieces of information that they need at that time. Um, and we also do have um, publications called Investing in Your Future that covers nuts to bolts everything that a student needs to know about financial aid and how to keep it and the requirements. And that's on our homepage as well. It's um, part of the, you know, uh, additional information for you. And so we do keep it on our, on our main, main page and it's called Investing in Your Future. It's updated every year. Thank you, Mary. Come on guys, don't be shy. Charlene, I wanted to thank you for making this not only an informative presentation, but also fun, like seeing those questions and being able to answer them real time was excellent. And I only have one question because of that. So um, there's, as I'm sure you and others on the call know, there's been some real apprehension about taking out student loans. And so what is it in our brief conversations with students about these topics that we should know? How do we you know, explain that this is really an investment in their education and, and especially if it's going to help them register or persist, what are some things that we should know about? Ashley, thank you so much for asking that question. We get it often. And truly, as you indicated, an AU education is an investment. That's why we say investing in your future. We try to leverage every penny that we can from other sources simply because we have limited resources and we wanna make sure that we can use as much as our funding to bridge the gaps that exist for students once they've been able to leverage all of the aid that they have been offered to include federal loans. Now, let's put this in context. A lot of times people are like, oh, I can't have students incurring a mountain of debt. The truth is, most students um, incur less than $18,000 total in debt upon leaving aid because the federal government limits the amount of money that a student can receive from them. So an incoming first year student, the maximum amount of money that they can borrow from the federal government is $5,500. As a sophomore, that number goes up to $6,500. And in the final years, it goes to 7,500 for each year. However, most students, again, because of the way in which we fund our students, don't need to actually leverage the full amount of the loan that they have been offered. However, we do encourage our students to take full advantage of all of the funding to include their loans before we can assist them in awarding additional aid um, from our grant funding. Does that make sense, Ashley? Yes, it's very helpful. Thank you, Shirley. Oh, you're very welcome. Anybody else? I am so glad to see so many of the names that I know and haven't had a chance to connect with um, on this call. Um, thank you for coming and for asking questions and for, for participating. 
Um, and for those who are new, please feel free. Um, I am the only McDonald in the financial aid office. So um, feel free to reach out on Teams or to send me an email if you have questions. Um, one of the things that I wanna make sure that you know is that you're supported as well. As you're trying to do this important work with our students, as these questions come, please feel free to reach out. Yes, Jeff. Charlene, um, one, thank you. Uh, let me echo the thanks from Ashley for participating and sharing your expertise. But can you maybe talk to us a little bit about um, the topic around emergency funds and not that financial aid has emergency funds, but there are other pockets sometimes that are within the schools or other divisions. Um, and we often get the question of, you know, how do you access those? But more importantly, I think helping people understand where that those emergency funds tie into financial aid and some of the precautions that people need to make sure that uh, we are aware of so that we're not harming students in the end in any way. I, oh my goodness. I get my drift there, but I, I, I do need me to clarify that. Jeff, thank you for that question. It is really important. We know that there are emergent needs. We know that students will encounter things that sometimes they just can't um, that come out of the blue and they don't have the financial resources to assist them. The federal government actually has pretty clear and stringent rules around how we can allocate funding to students. There are um, seven specific categories that comprise of the cost of attendance. I'm sure you've heard that term. And they are the tuition that we charge all students, right? The mandatory fees that all students are assessed, the books that we anticipate students will need in order to complete their coursework, um, housing, food. Um, we also anticipate that students are going to have transportation costs and needs. And then lastly, we have a, a miscellaneous category, which is really for incidentals. Um, laundry detergent, those type of things that a student may need. And all of those um, categories are what make up the cost of attendance. And so any one of those categories that you're trying to award funds to assist a student will be counted as aid. So if you're trying to help a student with housing costs, right? If it isn't additional housing costs, beyond what we have already anticipated they will incur in that year, it's gonna be counted as aid. And if they've already received aid to cover all of their costs, it will be a dollar for dollar swap. Now, there are some students, for instance, that need emergency summer housing, right? And summer housing is not covered as part of their cost of attendance for the year as summer term is an elective term. If you're trying to use your emergency funding to cover summer housing, we'll include that cost of that housing to their cost so that when you do award the funding so that they can live on campus for the summer, it will offset the cost, but not necessarily negatively impact their eligibility for aid for the upcoming year. Is that clear? Thanks, Jeff. Okay, we're bumping up against our time. Thank you once again for coming. I really do appreciate all that you do to help our students navigate this. And if nothing else, I hope you come away with knowing that we're all in it together. We're trying to support our students. Um, and that, you know, if you have questions, please feel free uh, to reach out. Thanks all and have a good afternoon. Hi, Edith. Hi, Aida.